I'm really, really excited to be here today. And, and ever since I was asked to talk here, I've been thinking about this issue of breakthroughs. And it strikes me that for so many of you coming from this field of technology, entertainment and design, the way you achieve a breakthrough is completely different than in my field. I imagine that you work really hard towards something, trial and error, you know, a lot of investment, invention, creation, and then you have that light bulb moment. It goes on, and the world has changed forever. Take those of you here in the audience who created the TomTom. -tom. Think what that has done. Never again will husband and wives driving to a destination have to quarrel. Now, or think of those of you who, who make films. You know, you work really hard, and then there's an absolute. You have a product that we can watch, that we can buy. Now, in my field, it doesn't work that way so, so clearly. I work on, for, for the last 15 years, I've been working on, on peace building, on the promotion of human rights, on poverty alleviation. And for us, change is, is not as, as absolute. We often don't know whether that light is on or whether it's actually off. It can be flickering. Sometimes we think we have achieved change, but actually we realize we didn't. And sometimes when change happened, we didn't even realize it. Let me give you an example. I used to be a quite heavy smoker, two packs a day, sometimes litting one cigarette with the other. Now, a bit more than a decade ago, I gave up smoking. So formally, I had become a non-smoker. But mentally, I was still smoking. Whenever I called a restaurant to make a reservation, I would ask for a table in the smoking section. And it took a long, long time before I had actually become, in my head, a non-smoker. Or take something like the Dayton Agreement that brought an end 14 years ago to the horrors that were taking place in Bosnia. Now, for most of you, it must have looked like, oh, we have the Dayton Peace Agreement, we have peace in Bosnia. But no, the war ended, so technically there is peace. But if you look at what is happening nowadays in Bosnia, they can't even agree on creating a national electricity grid. It's not sure, I'm not sure that actually the Dayton Agreement was a breakthrough. So even though it's hard in my sector to, to find out how you create change, I do believe there are five elements that help to increase the chances of success. And today I would like to share those five with you. The first one. You have to believe, and this is the most important one, that the impossible is actually possible. You have to have this big, big vision of change. And you have to believe that that dream of change can actually become reality. Think about the Berlin Wall. Who would have thought in the early 80s that the Iron Curtain could go down? Or think about the end of apartheid in South Africa. Who would have thought that that would happen 10 years before it actually took place? And it isn't only those big things, like getting a black American to become the president of the United, change, uh, the United States. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that, um, that, that can, you know, where you can see that big, big change happen. I'm thinking of my friends in Egypt, courageous women who 10 years ago decided, you know what, we're sick and tired of female genital mutilation. And they fought and they fought, and they now have a law that prohibits it, that their girls, their daughters, are circumcised. So, what you need is to believe that the impossible is possible. And once you have that big dream, you have to become very pragmatic. Change doesn't happen overnight, it goes step by step. And I know from experience, it's very often two steps forward, one step back. You have to change your strategy, you, you have to make concessions, you have to compromise, and you might encounter failure. 
I remember when a year ago we went with Jimmy Carter, Kofi Annan, and Russell Michel to Zimbabwe. We wanted to highlight the dire humanitarian situation that was happening, the cholera epidemic, um, the, the, the schools had closed down, the hospitals, and, and nobody was paying attention to this. Now, we arrived in Johannesburg, and we learned that President Mugabe was refusing us entry. They could say mission failed all over. But no, we figured, let's use that to our own success. So we called a press conference, and there you have Jimmy Carter standing like, you know, I've been to more than 170 countries in my life, and I have never, ever been denied access. Now, we became a news story, headline news overnight, and managed to draw maybe more attention to the situation in Zimbabwe than we could have done if Mugabe hadn't, you know, stopped the access. So you have to, you have to be pragmatic. The third one is that we can all make a difference, but none of us can do it alone. I think of Archbishop Tutu, the chair of the elders, when he says it so beautifully. He says, we are all tiny drips of water in a huge, huge ocean. Now, if you want to create that wave of change, you need many, 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 many drops of water. I thought I was going to be a management consultant. But then, I happened to get the opportunity to become part of the wave that was trying to stop the genocide in Bosnia. And it changed my career completely. I basically realized there were people all over Western Europe, Margaret Thatcher, Simon Wiesenthal, Bernard Kushner, who were speaking out about the horrors that were taking place in Bosnia, only two hours away from us. And I figured out, you know, if they're all speaking on their own, why not bring them together and have their voice be stronger so that hopefully they can put more pressure on West European governments to do something. Now, you know, I was 25. I couldn't really write a letter to Margaret Thatcher saying, hey, I'm Mabel, 25, join my club. But I was lucky enough that somebody put me in contact with somebody who actually had that power. And so, basically, by working together, we created the European Action Council for Peace in the Balkans. But there were many other people working in that wave dealing with the genocide in Bosnia. There were the women of Sarajevo, for example. Caught in a city, the longest siege in, in modern history, locked up like animals. And every morning when they stood up, they would put on their most beautiful clothes, amazing makeup, and they would go into the street, knowing that they might actually not make it until the end of the day, because they might be hit by a shell. But this was their way of saying to the Serbs surrounding them, you know what? You can't defy us. You can't humiliate us. You might kill us, but you won't get us. Or I think of Zdravko Grebo, my friend in Sarajevo, who decided to set up a an, an radio station with the funkiest, coolest music possible, because he felt that is a way to create moral resistance against the evil that's taking place. So whenever I traveled to Sarajevo, he would send me these lists with CDs that I had to buy. And I was always so proud when showing the lists to the shopkeepers here, the record owners here in, in Amsterdam, when they said like, whoa, your friend has a really funky taste, quite avant-garde. So you see how all these people and many more help to make a difference there. And we can all make a difference. The fourth point is leadership. Somebody needs to steer that wave of change in the right direction. Somebody needs to have the power to take all the people with him or her. And I think there are three kinds of leaders. You have the formal leaders, you have former leaders, and you have informal leaders. Now, the formal leaders are the sitting politicians. And some of them are great, 
and some of them use their power not so wonderfully. Think, for example, about the, the British government. Whatever you think of them in a whole lot of fields, what they've done in the last 10 years in the fight against global poverty is absolutely amazing. Just one example is that they helped to get more than 5 million kids into school. But you also have leaders who use their power to basically fill their own bank accounts. The second kind of leaders is the former leaders. People like the elders, with whom I'm so privileged to work. And they have the amazing luxury that no longer holding power, but still having influence, they don't have to get re-elected every four years. They don't have to be reappointed. They can actually speak the truth. And they have the luxury to make themselves unpopular. And then you have the informal leaders. People who seem completely ordinary, but they are actually extraordinary. I think of Carmen, 15-year-old girl. I met her a few months ago in, an, in a township close to Cape Town. Her story was amazing, but not unique. She was raped multiple times by her father before she even knew her own age. Taken out of the family, put in a foster care family. Guess what the head of the household did? Same story. Is taken away from the foster care family, placed back with her mother, who by that time has a new boyfriend. And guess what? Same story. So there is Carmen, 15 years old, HIV positive. She, in one way or another, found the strength to say, you know, what happened to me is awful, but it's happening to others, and I'm going to make sure that it happens less in the future. So she became a peer educator. And she's talking to kids of her own age about the rights that girls have to say no. About the dangers of unprotected sex. And she's helping to address the stigma and the taboos that are still surrounding HIV AIDS. Now for me, <coughs> Carmen is a real leader. The fifth element of success is patience. We live in a society, and the minister already mentioned that, of instant satisfaction. Everything has to go quick, 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 quick. If something breaks down, we don't repair it, we throw it away. Things are black or things are white. And if things don't go quick enough and if we're not satisfied, we move on and we're upset. Now, the kind of change that I work on doesn't happen overnight. We actually very often overestimate what we can achieve in the short term, but we underestimate what can be achieved in the long term. And working with the elders is amazing because they have such a tremendous concept of time. Think of all the years that Nelson Mandela had to spend in jail before he saw his country become truly free. And it's actually odd, because the elders don't have that much time ahead of them. Yet they are all the time taking the long view. So, where does that leave all of us? You don't need me to tell you that humanity is facing incredibly big challenges. Climate change, increasing intolerance towards the other, wars, and as we sit here this morning, thousands of children have died worldwide unnecessarily because they didn't have the necessary medicine or food. Now, I'm not here to preach to you, and I'm not going to tell you what you should do. But I do know that each and every one of us can make a difference. You can give your money. You can give your brain power. You can give your time and your energy. When you walk in your street tomorrow and you see that stranger, 
You can actually say hi to him and reach out to him. So if you decide to become part of a wave of change, please do not forget. The impossible is possible. You'll need a whole lot of pragmatism, and you might fail and have to readjust along the way. You'll have this amazingly pleasant experience of finding other change makers who are trying to do the same thing and team up with them. And you'll have to have a lot of patience and perseverance. Now, if you decide not just to watch, but to also do, and if you happen to get involved in one of those waves of change on which I'm currently working, I would love to see if we can work together. Many thanks for your time. <laughs>